four generation scanners. They are full feature. They combine the best of all the techniques that we have discussed. Now let's take a look at the technologies for antivirus. There are scanners. Under scanners, you have interceptors, you have disinfectors, you have heuristic scanners, then you have inoculators, integrity checkers, that file integrity checkers, safe computing or practice common sense. N bar or quality of service, antivirus packages. Now, N bar is network based application recognition. An example of detection is the Ninda virus, was detected using the N bar or QoS method. The scanners basically have a method of twofold protection one is it scans the files, second, background checking, that's also called interceptors. It checks for viruses by analyzing the virus signatures. It works on known viruses that are unencrypted. So that's the key point. So anything you encrypt and keep you as a virus, it will not detect. Unknown viruses can be detected by monitoring activity. So if you see a sudden surge or sudden usage of memory, very high memory, then you probe into that and check, then you will know that there is a virus. But the problem is, False alarms will be issued. There may genuinely be an application which is consuming a lot of memory. But the new technologies that are coming in are improving this. But then your antivirus software is only as good as your last update. So generally when we go for an audit, we ask them when was the or when you verify when the antivirus signatures are last updated. You have varying effects or varying results during the order. In some it is up to date on some computers. On some computers it has not been updated for a year. So your latest signatures will not be detected, virus signatures will not be detected. So it becomes a problem. That system which is not updated may in fact go on and infect other systems which are not updated with the latest virus databases. Then the technology scanners also speed up by scanning in various ways. Like it's a part of the heuristic process. It can actually select only the EXEs for file viruses, boot sectors for boot viruses, etc. So you can have a search criteria or a pattern for which you can speed up the process of antivirus scanning. And then the algorithms are there built in to scan only the sections of a file rather than the whole file. The disinfectors can also be built into reputable scanners. They are actually built into reputable scanners. It can remove a virus from a file, but it may not be able to do so without damaging the file. If the files cannot be disinfected, then they can be quarantined. It's a separate area which the antivirus software marks or holds where the probability of infecting other files are remote. So it keeps it in a quarantined area. But that still does not mean that your system is safe. The scanners check for viruses by using heuristics. There is a 70-80% success rate. Unknown viruses can also be detected meaning it looks for the characteristics of a file and it determines the probability of it being infected. It can find and stop some new viruses from executing. And the heuristic scanners are also used to find viruses without signatures, metamorphic viruses. These viruses expand and contract inside, so it is difficult to actually find out whether it is a virus or not. It may use encryption as well, so when it uses encryption, again the rate of detection is low. It uses a point system to detect. That means certain actions get a certain number of points. If enough points are accumulated, then the scanner is set off. It can be applied for what viruses not to scan. So the scanners can be configured to be, okay, don't scan the system for this virus. That can be done. Now you have added another fancy name, inoculator. What it does is it marks 
the sectors and files as infect infected in the usual spot where the viruses look. So it doesn't look in that spot anymore. And it doesn't work in today's environment. It makes program self-checking. That means it inserts a code at the beginning of a program to compare the generated data to stored data. That is before image and after image. It can be succumbed by stealth viruses. That's one of the downfalls. Check code or stored code can be modified. It sets off alarm for the interceptors. And it also prevents some program from working. These are the downfalls of the inoculators. Then the integrity checkers. Now the viruses infect or attack by making changes to the system. We know that. We have learnt it by now. Integrity checkers monitor system changes. It initially scans the disk and records a unique signature for all files and partitions. It can also alert the user of a virus when certain changes are made. It allows you to see what damage has been done by the virus. It can also be used to detect unknown viruses. But what are the things that are holding the integrity checkers back? It must be combined with a good scanner. So standalone integrity checkers may not work. Scanners that incorporate these integrity checkers don't incorporate them effectively. That means it is not checking enough changes. Some checkers are slow and unwieldy, difficult to handle, it uses a lot of memory. It can also be implemented in detecting system break-ins. This is the human element of it. The basic things that every computer user should do. Do not leave a USB plugged in when you shut down or restart a computer. If your USB flash disk has a write protect, use it. And be suspicious of email attachment from unknown sources. Don't double click it. Don't open it. If you don't know the center, delete it. Verify that the attachments have been sent by the author of the email. Newer viruses, that is the ones that are prevalent now, can send email messages that appear to be from people you know, but actually aren't. And do not set your email program to auto-run attachments or auto-preview. And the most important thing is obtain all Microsoft security updates. Back up your data frequently. There is a very famous saying by Simon L. Garfinkel in his Unix book. One who does not archive is condemned to rewrite. So take the backups of the system, your files regularly. Otherwise, you will have to redo the whole process again. Disable Windows scripting. Look at extensions. Now, if you look at this example, Mega underscore song dot exe. It's a song. It's not a exe. So you will come to know that there is a problem. It should be dot mp3 or dot mov or dot avi. Familyvacation.com. I mean, you have to look at the extensions very, very diligently to see if there is a possibility of a virus. And then look out for double extensions a dot jpj and a dot exe together this is just an example it could be a combination of any two files that is a issue this double extension thing actually works even though it's a very it sounds very stupid the windows itself will hide the extension of known types so it will appear as having only a single extension so you have a dot text dot jpg it may display, it, Windows will display only .jpg. It will not display the .text .jpg. So that actually works for the virus. Some of the popular packages, there are so many. There is no allegiance to any of these companies, but the, some of the popular ones have been listed here. Norton is one, Avast is a free one, Kaspersky, McAfee, Sophos. There are several others. I mean, you can think of so many antivirus. In India itself, there was something called K7 computing. So there are several 
antivirus technology packages available. So I myself have become tired by talking about virus. Let's go and see what's a worm. Worm is similar to a virus but propagates itself through the internet by breaking into machines. What is the main goal? It is to bring down and deny access to the networks and services. It does not rely on user intervention and it does not rely on being transmitted physically, that is via disk. And it does not rely on being emailed or transferred by the user, it does it by itself. But then when you have viruses, why do you need worms? Because of ease, you write it and launch it once, then the worm takes care of it. Then you have many acquisitions and it continuously works. Then the pervasiveness, it weeds out the weakest targets, it penetrates difficult networks. So now if you look at the definition, it is a self-propagating piece of malicious software. It attacks vulnerable hosts, infects them, then uses them to attack other vulnerable hosts. Some of the famous ones were the Morris worm of 1988, the Raman worm, the Lion worm, Ador worm, Code Red, uh, of late it's the Nimda. But then who writes these worms? Hackers write it to penetrate networks, crackers do it. The researchers do it, then there are a specific brand of people called virus writers. Their job is to write the virus. They can be used by both the antivirus companies or by malicious people. Or with the intention of destruction, they can be motivated. But when you look at viruses versus worms, the basic difference is viruses require interaction. That means it needs a carrier, it needs some action on the part of the user to propagate. But the worms act out on their own. Viruses use social attacks, worms use technical attacks. So there is a big difference between virus and worms. The main goal of the worm is to disrupt the network and deny access. Many shut down antivirus and firewall applications. So the worm has a capability to shut down your antivirus program or your firewall applications. It's not concerned about detection. In 1988, the worm shut down 3000 to 6000 computers. So at that time it was 5 to 10 percent of the internet. And growing trends of the worms making the headlines rather than true viruses. Now is it code red was famous, Nimda was famous, Opaso was famous. You have to think of worms like this. It's got widespread geographic in infection rather than a system infection. The virus has got a widespread system infection. This has got a widespread geographical infection. So it finds a potential target, replicates itself, transfers itself, executes. So worms are much more dangerous than virus. What are the worms beginnings? When did it start? It started in 1978 and John Shop invented the concept at Xerox Palo Alto Research Labs. It was designed as a useful tool that borrowed clock cycles from idle CPUs and it actually got off out of control even then. Morris was a very famous internet worm. There is an article on that. It's replicated here. On November 2nd, 1988, Robert Morris Jr. A graduate student in computer science at Cornell wrote an experimental self-replicating, self-propagating 99-line program called a worm and injected it into the internet. He chose to release it from MIT to disguise the fact that the worm came from Cornell. That was a smart move. Morris soon discovered that the program was replicating and infecting machines at a much faster rate than he had anticipated. There was a bug, so that's why this happened very fast. Ultimately, many machines at the locations around the country either crashed or became catatonic. When Morris realized what was happening, he contacted a friend at Harvard 
to discuss the solution. Eventually, they sent an anonymous message from Harvard over the network, instructing programs on how to kill the worm and to prevent reinfection. The estimated cost of dealing with the worm at each installation ranged from $200 to more than $53,000, so the damage was quite high. In 88, $200 was big, $53,000 even bigger. How it did not bring 6,000 machines now? This particular worm did not alter or destroy the files. And it didn't save or transmit the password which it cracked. The worm didn't make special attempts to gain root or super user access into a system. It didn't place copies of itself or other programs into memory to be executed at a later time. So again, it didn't do a time bomb like function. It didn't attack machines other than Sun 3 systems and wax computers running 4 BSD units or equivalent. So it was again focused on a small range of OSs. The worm didn't attack machines that were attached to the internet and it didn't travel from machine to machine via a disk. It didn't cause physical damage to the computer system. But then it took down 10% of the internet. How did it take it down? It utilized a variety of unit security holes at that time. Uh, send mail, remote debug was an issue. It allowed the worm to execute rem remote com commands on the system. The send mail remote debug vulnerability allowed the worm to execute remote commands on the system. It obtained user lists. It ran a dictionary attack of 432 common passwords on user list. And even in 1988, the passwords then were as insecure as the passwords that we use today. How the first worm changed the system administration? File access should be limited. That worm could open the encrypted password file. Network should use a conglomerate of OSSs. That is, a Unix virus will not affect a Windows 2000 server or a Windows 2008 server or a 2012 server. It brought about forums of geeks for sharing research. And then beware of reflexes. Many system administrators shut down the send mail to stop the viruses, but only delayed information on how to patch it and fix it. So just by pulling off the internet, they didn't actually prevent the attack. They just delayed the attack from happening. Logs are monotonous but are extremely useful in troubleshooting. So as auditors or as security practitioners, we also we always tell the customers to have a proper log management system, to monitor the logs, but then the logs provide a lot of information about how a network performs, what the issues are on specific devices, what actually is happening in the applications or on the network. It's very helpful in troubleshooting problems. So, logs are... The first worms were actually designed and released in the 80s. Worms were non-destructive and generally were released to perform helpful network tasks. If you take an example, vampire worm, it, it remains idle during the day. At night, it would use the spare CPU cycles to perform complex tasks that required extra computing power. Sometimes it could also be that these worms were used as a automatic scheduled light outs operations for taking the system backups when the CPU cycles are idle. So at night time, generally when the processing is not done much, these worms used to run and create a backup and keep it. But ultimately, over a period of time, the negative aspects of the worm came to light. An internal Xerox worm crashed all computers in a particular research center. When machines were restarted, the worms repropagated and crashed the machines again. So it, uh, that was the negative aspect of the worm. And there are six components of the worms. The first is the reconnaissance or the fingerprints. 
then specific attacks, command interface, the communication mechanisms, intelligence capabilities, used and non-attack capabilities. We'll look at this. Reconnaissance means target identification. There are active methods it uses, like scanning. Also passive methods, like voice fingerprinting, traffic analysis. What are specific attacks? Buffer overflow, CGI bin, Trojan horse injections. But it's limited in targets. There are two components for it, for the attacks. One is local.